pleasure to be here uh, discussing viable pathways for the transition of global society. Um, I was just going to make some framing up uh, comments and outline a few uh, pathways for the discussion during our session. Uh, and then John is going to talk about a specific pathway and, and technique. So in terms of uh, the need for global governance, uh, that's clear in certain areas. We've, we've talked about it here, such as international regulation of certain issues, finance, technology, and many others for the environment, for security and human rights. There are many barriers to global governance that we've also discussed, uh, the corporate focus on profits and uh, corporate control of governments, media, the economy, uh, the interests of national sovereignty, structure of the UN, uh, the identity of people with their countries instead of global society, and uh, low public awareness and, and deception about global governance and the benefits that that would provide. Uh, so it, it seems like it's difficult to uh, achieve global governance, but the reality is, is that our flawed ideas and systems, including governance systems, are driving rapid environmental and social degradation, and that change is inevitable. Things aren't going to stay the same. The, what's happening in the U.S., Brexit, and many other factors indicate that things are accelerating. And we, you know, we're not talking about 20 years, maybe we're talking about two or three years before there's some substantial change that if we're not ready for it could be, I mean, either we'll get ready for it and figure out viable pathways to a sustainable global society, or we're going to face rapidly growing pain and then the collapse, which will bring even more pain. So um, somebody asked the other day, uh, Olivia, you know, why, why do we tolerate, uh, you know, things that are happening? And I think it's, one of it is is the idea of the old analogy of you know and, and my apologies to amphibians for using this example but if you throw a frog in a pot of boiling water it'll hop right out but if you put it in cold water and heat it up they'll stay there and, uh, as things get get worse and so if any of these things that are happening now uh, happened overnight we wouldn't tolerate it but uh, you know, it's happening over a period of years, chemicals, environmental problems, social problems, inequality gets a little worse every year instead of getting greatly worse at once. So that's, that's probably one of the reasons for change. Although if you look at it from a geological perspective and the graphs of human society since the Industrial Revolution, uh, it's like we're an explosion. You know, we're destroying ourselves and we're in the, in the middle of the explosion. We just don't see it because, uh, you know, our, 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 because of our frame of reference. So um, Gary mentioned the need for a cohesive vision, and there, you know, I don't think there's one right answer for that, but there is one vision that we could use for a sustainable society, and that is in nature. It's all around us. Nature has worked for 3.5 billion years. Uh, it knows how to survive and have broad prosperity. So we could imagine what human society would look like if we were manifesting the wisdom of nature in it. And it's that's since we are part of nature, it's not at all utopian to think that we can't achieve that. It's, uh, it's actually utopian or, uh, or irrational to think that we can continue to live outside the laws of nature and reality and continue the way we are. That's a completely irrational idea that, that you know, is without basis. So in terms of a vision for sustainable society, some of the principles of, of nature that would apply to, to give us a sense of what human society might look like in a sustainable form would be seeking balance instead of growth, uh, equitable distribution of resources between um, species and generations, equal valuing of current and future generations, producing no waste, living off of renewable resources, and allowing each uh, each individual to reach their fullest potential. This already happens all around us and within our own bodies. So the idea that we couldn't take that and bring that into human society is not rational. I mean, that's who we are. We should be able to achieve that. The idea that we can't re results from our limited perspective, thinking that we're separate and needing to compete. But as our consciousness raises to the level of, of the awareness that we're actually <coughs> parts of one system and working together, cooperating as occurs in nature, uh, is the most effective path forward. You know, we can move in that direction. So there's a lot of hope. Um, many people tend to, including myself at times, tend to focus on the negative and all the bad things happening. But Gary's pointed out many good trends that 
you know, with the EU and, and um, the development of nation states was positive in many ways and disparate groups being able to work together. So there's a lot of hope. And I just wanted to outline, touch on a few pathways forward to use as um, a basis for discussion during our group. Uh, one is the corporate and financial sector. Uh, they are, you know, operate in many ways in an unregulated international environment. They also have a lot of power over governments. Uh, so if we can find ways to get corporations to support global governance, uh, that would could it really accelerate the process. Now, there's many reasons why they would oppose it because it could interfere with profit and shareholder return maximization. One way to do it is to use the capital markets to hold companies accountable. We've been doing that for over 20 years with responsible investing. So if we expand the purview of responsible investing from a company's negative impacts to their efforts to change larger systems, then we can harness the capital markets to push companies for global governance and other types of systemic changes. Another um, uh, area pathway is uh, national government reform. To have global governance, <coughs> national governments will have to cede power in some way. So unless we deal with the problems at the national level, it would be very difficult to have global governance. Uh, that involves things like replacing plutocracy with democracy and other factors. Another pathway is to unite and empower citizens, and this might be the most important one, because all power ultimately resides with the people. But unfortunately, as the founders of the U.S. knew, it's very easy to mislead, divide, and disempower the people. So <coughs> finding ways to, uh, to unite the people and help, and help them to work together on their common interests is, is essential, especially ending the war between conservatives and liberals, which is a dominant factor in the U.S. It's the reason for our current administration, the main reason for Brexit, and many other problems. Ways to do that are to weaken political parties, require honest media, hold media accountable for the lies that they often tell about focusing on small problems and ignoring big ones, and promoting rational thinking, uh, getting away from the dogmatic blind faith. Population is another one. Someone mentioned that population is a major problem. A number of studies have shown that just providing voluntary birth control to all women who, who want it and empowering women would uh, stabilize the population without any involuntary or coercive uh, population control. Another one is to engage and empower youth. Now often young people are running away by staring at their iPhones, taking drugs, or engaging in harmful behavior. And some of the reasons for that, I, I, I would suggest, are our disempowering education system, competitive grading teaches um, average and below average students that they're inadequate. Uh, it teaches them to rely on external validation for their self-worth. So getting rid of competitive grading would be a big step. Standardized curriculums teach young people that will tell you what, what you should be focusing on, not what you want. So it teaches them that their own interests often are, are irrelevant. Um, so other things, and also they see, uh, I could imagine that young people would feel alienated because we say we care about them, but we're degrading the environment and society that they'll need to survive. So our, our actions aren't matching our words. And if, you know, if we start to do that, I, I would think that they would appreciate it. Uh, so with education, implementing empowering education that doesn't rank and judge students. There's no need to compare students to each other. The only need is to make sure that they're progressing, <coughs> so you don't need competitive grading. Um, teaching them to think for themselves. Another one is, a another pathway is culture change. A book called The Nordic Secret talks about the success in Scandinavia. Um, and part of the reason for that is that for many decades they've been teaching young people to that um, su success of everyone is equal to the success of the individual. So there's not so much focus on showing off, but more on helping everyone. And then f one final pathway I mentioned before is increasing wisdom in human society as we begin to honor uh, the, the more dominant characteristics of women, uh, cooperation, uh, systems thinking, relationships, empathy, uh, it will, those are the things we need to turn, to turn our world around. We have an abundance of power and lack of wisdom. And as we honor and teach wisdom, it'll naturally elevate the status of women, I think, to a position of equality with men. And it'll help us to 
um, adopt the, the statement that I may have gotten incorrectly from the, the young man from Italy who's, who was here before when he said every Italy and to me the way I, I'm not even sure he said that but if he did what that meant to me was that we right now love our own country and, and, and people and citizens and we should extend that out to every country recognizing that every country is our own country because we're all part of the global human community. So thank you. I'll turn it over to John.